So having met Descartes, we've been introduced to the strongly rationalist perspective, which has dominated much of philosophy of mind in the latter, uh, since the 17th century. Um, and this is the approach that valorizes mathematics, reason, certainty, logic. All very nice things, of course, and wouldn't we all like to know everything uh, perfectly and well, but we will also be making ourselves aware of the concerns that arise from an empirical point of view, where we must emphasize that we are embodied beings who obtain knowledge through the good offices of their body, through the senses, and through experience in the world. Let's stay with Descartes for a little bit, because Descartes, in his partitioning of things into the physical and the mental, has set up a metaphysical stall, as it were. And metaphysics is not science. Let's be clear about that. Um, the world is not as simple as that, and it's not as simple, we can't also can't say that metaphysical questions belong simply in philosophy. Metaphysical questions often coincide with theological questions, religious questions, if you will. And I'm not talking about institutional religion, I'm talking about them. Um, assumptions about what we can say is real, what exists, where stuff comes from, where stuff goes to, these are metaphysical questions. Metaphysical questions then do not admit of simple answers, but rather they are often prior to any kind of scientific investigation. Now, metaphysics is often somewhat reduced, using the term ontology, to questions of what exists, and in that case, it's separated from epistemology, which is how do you know anything? They may seem separate, but these questions are continually entangled because what it is to know, what it is to have knowledge of something, depends very much on what kind of things you think are real. Cognitive science is in an unusual position as a science. It is a form of practical epistemology, but because epistemology and metaphysics ne are never going to be successfully disentangled, you can't really do good cognitive science without some awareness of the metaphysical questions. So, Descartes gave us a specific kind of metaphysical framework. It's a dualist framework. In fact, it's a specific form of dualism called substance dualism. A dualism because there's two kinds of things in his scheme. Res extensa was his Latin name for stuff that takes up space. And res cogitans, the stuff of ideas that cannot be found in any spatial location. For him, these are separate things. Now, we've mentioned that this introduces a problem, which is that the stuff of ideas must somehow interact with or share reality with the stuff that takes up space. Otherwise, the idea of willfully moving something would not make any sense. And it's very difficult to get this to work. Oh, sorry, just to mention that Descartes when he says, I think, therefore I am, and that becomes the Latin phrase cogito ergo sum, has reified mind in a particular way. And this has a name, the cogito is Descartes' reification of mind. So that's helpful because it means that some of the other senses of mind can be avoided if we use the technical term cogito. So how would you get this interaction between the mental and the physical to work? There's been blood spilled over this. There's been lots and lots and lots of vain attempts to set up a view of the universe in which the mental and the physical interact in different ways. Three of them are shown here. Each of them has problems. Interactionist dualism suggests that physical stuff causes mental stuff and mental stuff causes physical stuff in an unbroken chain like this. Um, where and how that happens is unclear. We need a vehicle for that. Um, so that leaves us with a big question mark. Epiphenomenalism is a rather pessimistic suggestion in which physical stuff causes physical stuff causes physical stuff. Physical causation is continuous. 
in accordance with our best scientific understanding of the world. And the mental stuff is not really real. It's, it, it's, it's there, but it's just an epiphenomenon. It's something that arises, but it's not actually causing anything. On that rather pessimistic view, you would be a vain spectator of the goings-on that occur around you. You would not be actually participating. You would be deluded into thinking that you're taking part in the world. Not a good position. Psychophysical parallelism is uh, well, it's another attempt in which there's physical stuff causes physical stuff causes physical stuff in unbroken duration. Mental stuff causes mental stuff. The free association of ideas, the way one thought leads to another thought, all that goes on. And there's appeal then to a superordinate, a, an, an external means of keeping them aligned. So we need a referee here who's going to make sure that the mental stuff and the physical stuff don't get out of line. So that introduces a third party whose name is God. That's sort of Leibniz's solution to this. So Descartes tried more or less the interactionist view, using the pineal as the point of um, interaction, but it didn't make any sense. Epiphenomenalism, you'll find it in Calvinism, makes you helpless, predetermined. Psychophysical parallelism requires an external referee. So you can see that there's problems with this metaphysical picture, despite its cogency, despite the fact that it seems to make a great deal of sense, and despite the fact that it starts from this self-assured statement, I am. You wouldn't think two words could be so controversial. Now, we're just going to dwell on... Descartes' notion of the cogito and his substance dualism a little bit more. It's given rise to a very interesting thought experiment. Most thought experiments are not terribly interesting, to be honest with you. You can think up any old thing. and If it's not a real experiment, you don't find out too much. Um, this thought experiment certainly doesn't act like a scientific experiment, but it's what it is is an exercise in thinking. It became known in the 20th century as the brain and the vat thought experiment. Um, the idea is that if the brain, through some means, is generating the mental, the brain is the sole generator of the mental, so taking more or less the brain as the interaction point between ideas and matter, then is it plausible to think that as you sit there looking around you, securing your world, that you're actually so deluded that you are nothing, that you are a brain, but the brain in a evil scientist's lair, which has been hooked up to a big computer, providing inputs and outputs. The inputs presumed to be sensation or something which will cause sensation. What would the outputs be? Controls to muscles? perhaps, um, and you are in fact deluded. Now, it's a little hard to make that plausible, but luckily the Wachowski brothers did a great job of this in the first, uh, first of the three Matrix movies. If you haven't seen it, you really should. It's a very, very interesting and good movie. Second and third are not so good. Um, it's illustrated there in the bottom right-hand corner. This is a dystopian future state in which humans have been enslaved by machines and they are now farmed for something not very well specified called bioenergy. Um, so they're kept in pods and they have connections into their nervous system, into the base of the brain, which feed them inputs and outputs, just like the brain in a VAT experiment, to make them think that they're walking around in what we call the real world in frozen in 1999. Interesting plot. Very good. Raises lots of questions. But it very neatly captures the essence of the brain in a vat thought experiment. So how plausible is this? And the question is not, is this what's really going on? Of course, this is not what's really going on. The question is, does your view of the brain suggest that this makes any kind of sense? Or does this start out with a fundamentally implausible view of the brain? Now, I teach this a lot, and very often 
I get students to write about this. And what I find out is that what they usually take from this is, haha, maybe this is all a simulation. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is not to suggest to you, maybe this is all a simulation. You are not in a simulation, you are real. The point of this thought experiment is this. In order to make this a coherent thought, you must already be assuming some things about brains. And we need this thought experiment helps you to make those explicit. Here are some of the things that need to be in place for this to make any sense at all. The brain has to be seen as an input-output device generating conscious experience on the basis of those inputs and outputs. That means it must make sense to think of inputs and outputs to the brain as if the brain were distinct. It assumes that the inputs gener cause the brain to generate conscious experience and that merely electrical signals going into the brain, as one would have by jacking into a computer, is sufficient to generate consciousness. And it assumes that inputs and outputs are separate. Now, absent any of those, this is not a thought experiment, this is gobbledygook. So the point of this thought experiment is to make you aware that we can treat the brain in this way, um, and it opens certain possibilities, but it's not a given. Um, all of those assumptions can and should be contested. Not one of them, I think, is entirely plausible. Um, but when you treat the subject of this thought experiment as if it were coherent, you are assuming all of these things. They are frequently assumed in our everyday discourse. As I said, we've never got away from Descartes, even though he's introduced a problem. Nobody believes that this dualistic metaphysics is an accurate or believable picture, and yet we often act as if it was. Our informal everyday talk of ourselves frequently separates the mental and the physical, and we speak of inputs and outputs, and we act as if um, what we perceive were independent of what we do. Those are habits of thought that have grown in a specific cultural context. And Descartes and his contribution is part of that cultural context. It's quite popular in contemporary cognitive science to make it clear that you are not falling prey to any of these obvious missteps of Cartesian dualism. And people like to say, but you're a dualist. That's dualist. As if being a dualist was somehow um, inappropriate. Now, substance dualism is not likely, but our notion of substance has changed a great, great deal since Descartes. We don't divide the universe into kinds of stuff anymore um, in the medieval sense of substance, which is what Descartes was working with. And when we use language and when we talk about ourselves, we seem to always introduce dualism. If we even talk about the perception of the world by a subject, that separates subject from world. This introduces one more quirk, which we need to discuss. Let's come back to that certainty that Descartes said in those problematic two words, I am, <laughs> I exist. That assertion of separateness from everything else seems to open the door to something called solipsism. Solipsism is not a metaphysical position anyone wants to argue for. It's the idea that, hey, you know you're conscious, right? Maybe you're the only one. Maybe everyone else is just faking it. Maybe they're all machines, and maybe you're the only sentient being in the universe. As you can see, the universe revolves around you. I hope you don't believe that. Nobody really believes that, but the Descartes' assertion of his own existence, independent of everything else in the universe, seems to open the door to this. Um, and introspection, or thinking about yourself, doesn't really help very much here. So if introspection seems to encourage this kind of solipsistic view, um, here's a kind of a remedy for it. 
When you're in the company of others discussing things, are your thoughts entirely your own? Is your experience so private? For Descartes to reach his starting point, he had to withdraw from the world. I think the best remedy against any kind of solipsistic delusion is simply to hang out with other people because then it becomes clear as it were that you're in this together that you're not independent beings that's my view we'll move on to empiricists in the next lecture